Today we're going to take a look at something that's going to feel like a review conceptually. However, now that we have the fundamental theorem of calculus and we're looking at applications of that, we can gain a new understanding of the true definition of integrals related to exponential functions and logarithms. The question we're going to answer is how do we define exponentials and logarithms. And we're going to start with some definitions, because up until this point, we have used logs and e to the x and natural log and just kind of waved our hands over it and said, it's just a thing that's been defined in such a way that. Well, now that we have the fundamental theorem of calculus, we can have our formal definition of the natural log. The natural log is defined by natural log of x. It is defined as the integral from 1 to x of 1 over t dt. This is the formal definition of the natural log. And what's nice is out of that definition from the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, you'll remember that the derivative of the left side is going to be equal to the function on the inside with the top piece plugged into it. So the derivative of the natural log of x is formally defined then as 1 over x. We're also going to formally define the number e such that from this definition, the natural log of e which is equal to the integral from 1 to e of 1 over t dt, that that integral will equal 1. e is the value that makes that integral 1. Turns out to be a little bit more than 2 and a little bit less than 3. We'll also define e to the x then such that the natural log of e to the x, or the integral from 1 to e to the x of 1 over t dt, is going to be simply equal to x. And what that establishes is an inverse relationship between e to the x and natural log. The natural log of e to the x is x, and e to the natural log of x will be x as a direct result. This gives us a couple additional properties that we can use with our derivatives and our integrals. Consider e to the x natural log of a. Now, our properties of exponents say a double exponent really means an exponent has been raised to an exponent. This is really saying e to the natural log of a to the x power. But because we have this inverse relationship, e to the natural log of anything is just that base. So e to the natural log of a becomes simply a. And we still have the x power on the outside. And in this way, we define any exponential as e to the x natural log of a. Why is this significant? Well. It's significant because now we can consider the derivative. Actually, let's call this subpoint A. Now we can consider the derivative of A to the x because we know that's the same as the derivative of e to the x natural log of A. And then using the chain rule, we can say e to the anything the derivative is that, x natural log of a, a, times the derivative of the inside. Well, the natural log of a is just a constant, so we have times the natural log of a. 
However, this e to the x natural log of a is simply equal to e a to the x based on our original definition, natural log of a. And so what we've really done is we have defined the derivative of anything to the x as that anything to the x times the natural log of a. And that's where that definition comes from initially. Before we just stated it and claimed it, now we have formally proved it. We can similarly do uh, exercise to calculate the integral of a to the x dx, because that's the same thing as the integral of e to the x natural log of a dx. Using u substitution, we'll let u equal the x natural log of a. Therefore, du is going to be the natural log of a dx, because that natural log of a is just a constant. We can multiply it inside and 1 over it on the outside. And that's going to give us 1 over the natural log of a times the integral of e to the u du, or 1 over the natural log of a e to the u plus a constant, which is equal to, and I'm just going to stick that e to the u in the numerator as I do this. Substituting back to x's, we have e to the x natural log of a all over the natural log of a plus our constant. But again, because we know e to the x natural log of a is equal to a to the x, this is going to simplify to a to the x over the natural log of a plus a constant. And what we've done is created a definition for the integral of a to the x dx. It's equal to a to the x over the natural log of a plus a constant. Previously, we just stated this was true. Now what we've done is we've actually proven it's true, all based on this original definition that the natural log of x is the integral from 1 over x of 1 to x of 1 over t dt. And so these consequences come out of it. And what this provides is a true understanding of how the natural log and the e to the x exponential function work and what their definition is. However, the emphasis of this lesson is going to be on actually taking derivatives and integrals with these functions. So let's first look at derivatives. And you've seen these derivatives before. Now we just understand why they work instead of just claiming they work. The derivative of the natural log of sine squared x. Well, by the chain rule, we take the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. So the outside is 1 over sine squared x. The derivative of natural log is 1 over the stuff, times the derivative of the inside. Well, the inside's an, expo an exponent problem, 2 sine x, times the derivative of its inside, which is cosine x. And this one will clean up really nicely. The sine gets rid of one of the signs. And cosine over sine, we know from trig, is just the cotangent of x. And so the derivative of the natural log of sine squared is two cotangents. Let's try this one. Let's take the derivative of the natural log of x squared plus 3x plus 1. Again, on the outside. The derivative of the natural log is 1 over the stuff over x squared plus 3x plus 1. And the chain rule says we multiply by the derivative of the stuff, 2x plus 3. And we don't have any simplifying there. So that will be our final derivative. Let's do one more. Let's take the derivative of the natural log of x squared and then we'll take the whole thing to the fourth power. 
One thing that I see before we start solving this to make it easier to work with, we can pull that second power in front of the natural log. Because an exponent inside the natural log can be moved out front. So what we end up with is two natural logs of x to the fourth power. Now, using the chain rule, on the outside, we have an exponential. So we take 4 times the inside stuff, which is two natural logs of x, all raised to the third power. times the derivative of the inside. The derivative of 2 natural log of x is just 2 over x. And so what we end up with is careful that 3 has got to go into each part. So we've got 2 to the third power, which is 8, times 4 times 2 is 64 natural log of x cubed all over x. So that's a quick review of taking derivatives with logarithms. That wasn't the only type of derivative we took with logarithms. If you remember, we also did what was called logarithmic differentiation, which was based on implicit differentiation whenever we had the variable in both the base and the exponent, or sometimes just to make more complex expressions simple. So for example, if we had y equals x to the sine of x power, and we wanted to find dy dx, before we took the derivative, we would first take the natural log of both sides. Because when we took the natural log, the exponent would move out front, and we would have sine x natural log of x. Then we could take the derivative. On the left, we get 1 over y dy dx. On the right, we've got the product rule. The derivative of sine is cosine x times the natural log of x, plus the derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x times the sine of x. And then to get the expression dy dx alone, we would multiply both sides by the y. And so we'd end up with dy dx is equal to the cosine of x, the natural log of x, plus the sine of x divided by x times y. But y is the original expression times x to the sine of x. And that would be our derivative. And that logarithmic differentiation was very helpful on these problems that would otherwise be impossible. But in addition, logarithmic differentiation gave us a much easier way to find dy dx when y is equal to something like e to the x sine of x over the square root of x times the natural log of x. We could, on this one, use the product rule in both the numerator and denominator within the quotient rule of the entire problem. But that would be a huge expression to simplify. This becomes much easier if we first take the natural log of both sides. Because we know that the numerator, being a product, is logarithms added to each other. So we take the natural log of both sides, we'll end up having a positive e to the x, a positive sine of the x. In the denominator, denominators are made by negative exponents. So those are going to be negative natural logs. So what we end up with when this spreads out is the natural log of e to the x plus the natural log of sine x minus the natural log of, I'm going to write it as x to the 1 half, minus the natural log of the natural log of x. And this can be even simplified further to make life easy by pulling these exponents out front. And so we end up with the natural log of y is equal to x times the natural log of e, which is just 1, plus the natural log of the sine of x 
minus 1 half natural log of x minus the natural log of the natural log of x. Now the derivative is much nicer. On the left, 1 over y dy dx. On the right, we have 1 plus the derivative of natural log is 1 over the stuff times the derivative of the stuff. The derivative of sine is cosine minus 1 half. Derivative of natural log is 1 over x minus the derivative of natural log is 1 over the stuff, natural log of x times the derivative of the inside. And the derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x. And so finally, to get our solution, we multiply both sides by the y to get dy dx equals, simplifying a bit as we do this, 1 plus cosine over sine is cotangent x minus 1 over 2x minus 1 over x natural log of x times y. But remember, y is the original function, e to the x sine of x over the square root of x natural log of x. And that derivative was much easier using logarithmic differentiation than it would have been using regular differentiation in the product rule and the quotient rule. All right, so now that we've reviewed derivatives with logs and exponentials, let's also review integration, the antiderivative. Let's first, first start with number 1. Let's first do the integral of x squared over x cubed plus 6 dx. Quite often with these, our key to make them work is going to be to use substitution. And you notice that denominator x cubed plus 6 has a derivative du of 3x squared. So we'll multiply by 3 and 1 third to get 1 third times the integral of 1 over u du, which is really nice because that's 1 third times the natural log of u plus a constant. But we have to change back to x's. So for our final answer, 1 third times the natural log of x cubed plus 6 plus a constant. Let's try another one. Let's do a definite integral this time. Let's do the integral from 0 to 1 of 4 over e to the x dx. Actually, let's do 4 over e to the 3x dx. One thing to make this easier to integrate that I'm going to do is I'm going to write that as the integral from 0 to 1 of 4e to the negative 3x dx. Now we can see straightforward that this is just a u substitution, where u is negative 3x and du is negative 3 dx. Oops, forgot the dx on the first example. So we'll multiply by a negative 3 inside and a negative 1 third outside. And when we do, we get 1 third times the integral. And we'll plug the limits of integration into u. 0, oops, negative 1 third. 0 times negative 3 is 0. 1 times negative 3 is negative 3. And one thing I might notice here is those limits of integration are kind of backwards. We usually go smallest to highest, but right now we're at 0 is bigger than negative 3. We can switch those and go from negative 3 to 0 if we also switch the sign in front of the integral. So we'll go from negative 3 to 0 of 4 e to the u du. which is 1 third times 4 e to the u, because the integral of e to the u is e to the u, integrated from negative 3 to 0. 
So if we plug those limits in, we get 1 third times 4 e to the 0 minus 1 third times 4 e to the negative 3. And I'll do a little bit of cleanup on that. e to the 0 is just 1, so we have 4 thirds minus 4 over 3 e cubed. In fact, we might even get a common denominator by multiplying by e cubed to get 4e cubed minus 4 over 3e cubed for our final answer. Let's do one last integral to wrap up here. This is my favorite integral using logs and substitution because it's not exactly obvious right away that we're going to go that direction. And it's the integral of tangent x dx. And cotangent's very similar. We don't have a direct way to get to tangent of x because there's no antiderivative of tangent of x. We don't know of any derivative that gives us an answer of tangent. However, we can rewrite this problem as the integral of sine x over cosine x dx. And when we do that, now we're set up for a u substitution, where u is the denominator, cosine of x, and du is the derivative of cosine, which is negative sine x. Well, we need a negative sign in there, so negative in and out dx. So we have negative integral of 1 over u du which is equal to the negative natural log of u plus a constant. Or going back to our x's, we get negative natural log of the cosine of x plus a constant as the antiderivative of the tangent. So again, today feels like a big review of integration and derivatives with logs and exponentials. But what's nice is now we have a clear definition of what the exponential is and what the natural log is so that we can work with them. We're going to build on this concept by doing some applications of exponentials and logs with tomorrow's lesson. But for now, we're going to get really good at reviewing how these exponentials and logarithms work. So take a look at the homework assignment, practice several of these, and we'll see you in class to work on them further.